Thanks so much for being here today, Dr. Pettigrew. Uh, really appreciate our time. And for those folks that have not met you, if you can share some of your background uh, and even what you're doing these days, uh, that would be great. I grew up on a farm uh, and I wanted to be a farmer. And, uh, but I also knew that I wanted to go to the university. So I uh, went to Southern Illinois University to get a degree in uh, animal industries. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was uh, a junior or senior, my advisor and some other faculty members started talking to me about graduate school. And I thought, well, what's two years when you're 21? So I'll get a master's degree and then I'll go home and farm. Uh, and so I, uh, I signed up for a master's degree. Mm -hmm. But I did something else important uh, on the way to that master's program. Uh, I worked, uh, I spent a summer working for a, on a pig farm in, uh, in Illinois. Those of you who lived through that era uh, would understand this, but it will be foreign to, uh, to the younger people. Mm. But in the 1960s, there were some leading producers who were taking very determined steps to raise pigs on a large scale and in confinement in buildings. Mm -hmm. because we'd always known that it's not possible to raise pigs in buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but they were doing it, and they were working closely with uh, Dick Carlisle, who was a, uh, a swine extension specialist at the University of Illinois, and they were making progress. Uh, and so I worked with Russ Jekyll, who some uh, of the viewers may have known, uh, who was one of those leading producers. I spent a summer with him. He was... Uh, producing pigs at a scale that was to then uh, astounding to many of us. He was producing 3,000 pigs a year, <laughs> and he was increasing 5,000 pigs a year. Wow. Now, that doesn't sound very much now, yeah. Yeah. but for me, coming from a farm with seven farrowing crates, it seemed like eno an enormous uh, operation. Yeah. And so I spent that summer with Russ uh, and uh, and got an exposure to the practical aspects of, of uh, what was then modern pig production, cutting edge pig production. I then went on to Iowa State uh, and got my master's degree uh, working with Dean Zimmerman. A couple of things happened uh, related to my master's program. One was that by the time I finished my master's degree, I realized that I liked research. And mm -hmm. so I, I discarded any notions of going home to farm. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing that happened was that I managed to hold off my draft board until I could hurry up and finish my degree. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as I finished that degree, I was drafted into the U.S. Army. Uh, and that was in, uh, in the 1960s at the height of the Vietnam War. Wow. Uh, fortunately for me, I did not go to Vietnam. Uh -huh. I spent my army time in a biological research unit in Maryland. Okay. Uh, so I was fortunate to do that. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. I then went to the University of, of Illinois for my PhD program, working with Dr. Bud Harmon. Uh, and I think the, the notable thing there is that I went to the University of Illinois and not to Iowa State. Now, mm -hmm. I was very happy with my, uh, my program at Iowa State. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked the people there, everything was good. Mm -hmm. uh, Iowa State then as now had a uh, strong program in swine nutrition. But I was determined to go somewhere else for my PhD mm -hmm. because I wanted to have the broader exposure uh, to another set of people, another way of doing things right. and, uh, uh, and getting to know uh, a different set of people. Mm -hmm. And so I think there was real value in, in my going to a, a different place, even though both of them were very strong. Uh, and I would encourage uh, young people to consider doing that to get that breadth of exposure. I think there's real value in that. Absolutely. No, I completely agree. When, uh, when I finished my PhD, I took what I thought at the time was the best job available in swine nutrition in the United States. And it was with a feed company. Mm -hmm. It was with the Mormon manufacturing company in 
Quincy, Illinois. Okay. Now, a number of people, a number of viewers will, will remember Mormons, uh, but it will be foreign to many of yeah. you because uh, some decades ago it was folded into ADM. Okay. But at that time, we were one of the leading uh, pig feed companies in, in the U.S., and I was manager of swine research. And I, I learned a lot in the five or six years I spent uh, with Mormons. Wow. But then I went on to the University of Minnesota mm -hmm. and joined the faculty there. And so I joined a, a strong swine nutrition team, uh, Steve Cornelius, Ronnie Mosier, Lee Johnston uh, at uh, Minnesota and, and had some good years there. I also worked very closely with the very strong swine medicine program in the veterinary school at, at Minnesota. Yeah. When I arrived there, it was led by Al Lehman mm -hmm. and later led by uh, Gary Dial. Mm -hmm. uh, both of those guys were very closely connected to the pig production industry and as well as the veterinary profession. Both of them also had PhDs in, in reproductive physiology. Uh, and so over the years, I worked quite closely with Gary Dial, uh, and we were, uh, we were interested in the connection between nutrient intake by the cell and her reproductive performance and lactational performance. Mm -hmm. And we think we made some contributions in, in, that, in that area. So I was at Minnesota for 17 years, but in the late 1990s, I did the unthinkable. I walked away from a tenured full professor position at a major research university mm -hmm. and set up a consulting business mm -hmm. in a small town in Missouri on the Mississippi River. Most animal nutritionists who have consulting businesses basically function as, as the nutritionist for their clients, whether it be a big production company, a feedlot, a dairy farm, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they, they generally function as, as that uh, practice nutritionist and I did some of that but the core of my business was working with feed manufacturing companies in other countries and so I had a long-term relationship with a, a feed company in Mexico uh, and another in Argentina and another in Brazil it was uh, an interesting time to be involved in some of those countries because they were emerging from times uh, under military governments when things were, were not very free. This was in the 1990s, and so it wasn't immediate, but, it, but the, the economy was expanding, mm -hmm. and the, uh, uh, the pig business was growing, and they were rapidly improving their production technology. And so it was my role there to help those feed companies move in the direction of doing the things that we were doing in the U.S. at that time. And so that was, uh, uh, that was an interesting experience. Uh, Very cool. I, uh, I really liked the consulting business. It was uh, something different, new every day. Uh, besides the things that I've talked about, I worked with the National Pork Board. I worked with a company that was, uh, was uh, raising pigs to be organ donors. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. turned out to be not successful, but they were making the attempt. Uh, but anyway, uh, I eventually found, somewhat to my surprise, that I was back in academia, this mm -hmm. time at the University of Illinois, in a very strong department there. Okay. And, uh, and when I went to Illinois, I changed my research directions. I no longer worked with cell nutrition, mm -hmm. uh, but I focused on the question of whether uh, we can improve pigs' disease resistance by things we put in the diet. And, uh, and so we started with a long list of candidate products or potential products. And I thought we would work through that list and throw away the ones that didn't work and then focus on the few that did. The surprising thing was that everything we touched seemed to have some beneficial effects on pig health. And uh, sometimes these were just physiological effects. Sometimes we could document practical effects. Uh, and over the years since then, we've seen uh, uh, widespread adoption of some of these products. And I think 
there's still a rich supply of, of other potential uh, candidates to be, uh, to be evaluated and, and perhaps adopted by the industry. So anyway, I, uh, I retired from the University of Illinois seven years ago, and I have remained a bit active, uh, working uh, primarily with a company on uh, their coordination of some of their research programs. And so, uh, so I'm, I'm not completely out of the business, but I'm not there uh, on a full-time, uh, full-time basis now. Wow. It's amazing uh, journey, journey there, uh, Dr. Pettigrew. Yeah, I appreciate you walking us through that. Um, as you step back and look at the research, and especially let's, let's maybe look at the cell research. For you, what are the biggest, you mentioned, you know, some contributions and no doubt about that. But for you, what are, were those biggest contributions from the cell nutrition standpoint? Well, I mentioned some things that uh, will not sound like a big contribution now, uh, but I think it was at the time. Okay. And so we were, we were feeding different uh, nutrient levels, energy and amino acid levels primarily. Mm-hmm monitoring the, uh, the uh, physiological hormones, the, mm-hmm. the metabolic hormones such as insulin and, and others, mm-hmm. also monitoring reproductive performance, monitoring things like LH release. And, uh, and the thing we kept finding is that a high insulin level seemed to be associated with good reproduction. Now we're we're talking about feeding the lactating cell, mm-hmm. and many of them are are in a catabolic state, losing weight rather than gaining. Right. Uh, and so, but the higher we could get the insulin level, it seemed, the better it was their reproductive performance after weaning. And so we uh, we were not prepared to suggest to producers that they uh, inject or infuse insulin into their cells. I think that would be a bit dangerous, mm-hmm. but we said, well, what, what, what does insulin mean? Mm-hmm. And, and we said, well, it means that there's a, a positive and anabolic metabolic state. So it it's associated with growth rather than with, with tear down of, of uh, tissue. And so we said, how do you get a positive metabolic rate? Well, you get, you get them to eat a lot. Now, in, in the 1980s and 90s, we would often read uh, uh, of lactation feed intakes in the neighborhood of 10 pounds a day. In heat stress situations, it might be eight pounds a day. And, uh, and that you can easily calculate that that's not enough to support the level of milk production. So you get weight loss, you get a catabolic state. And then one day, Gary and I were talking with a leading producer in, in Minnesota about feed intake during lactation. He said, I don't know what the problem is. My sows eat 18 or 20 pounds a day all the time. Mm-hmm. And then it occurred to us, maybe lactation feed intake is not something that just happens to you. Maybe it's something you can manage. And so Gary and I started going around the world giving talks on the importance of lactation feed intake and how you can encourage lactation feed intake. So we talked about the management of, of uh, the thermal environment, uh, the management of the feeding process, and some things about diet formulation. Mm-hmm. And, and I think over the years since then, we don't see a lot of reports of 10 pounds or 12 pounds a day feed intake in lactating sounds. We see more than that. So I think the industry has, has moved beyond that, that uh, serious problem that we had then. And I, I, I'm not claiming credit for that, but I like to think we made some contribution. Yes, I love it. No, that's, that's an amazing topic. And I'm particularly fascinated by gestation uh, nutrition. Uh, and, uh, but, but also on the link there, boy, we still see a lot of herds on the too heavy side of things and, and then not eating enough in lactation. So that's, that exactly. continues to be a, a big hurdle there for us. You know, do you, do you have any insights from the, the whole idea about full feeding since right 
right when they faring versus that you know step up program that folks used to do in the past any any perspective on that arena for many years i have encouraged full feeding from faring onward yeah. and i have uh, met with enormous resistance yeah and i i i, uh, I think it is it is reasonable uh, to step it up as long as you step it up fast but but i don't want to see uh, restrictions yeah. after th three days after farrowing. I want it to be a full feed by that point. And I prefer to start from farrowing. Yes. No, I think I, I completely agree. And the, the recent research that I've seen also match. And, and funny enough, this morning I was actually going back and forth on email because of this topic. And I think a lot of things that people sometimes think is, oh, if, I, if, if she eats a lot, if she binges, if you will, Next day, she, she's going to eat a little less or whatever, which it's true. But overall, she eats more if you feed full feeding, you know, from, from day zero. So yeah, That's right. We, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, uh, measuring feed intake of lactating sows on commercial farms. I think, that, I think the student involved, who's now a prominent scientist in Japan, uh, Yuzo Koketsu, Oh, yeah. I think he had daily feed intake values on 25,000 lactations or something yes. like that. And he clearly identified that there's often a dip in intake during lactation. And so we, yeah. we try to avoid that. You do get the dip a little bit more often if you feed heavily early on, but it's not very much more. And, uh, and I still think, uh, as you're suggesting, that, that we're better off getting as much into them as as we can, as soon as we can. Fantastic. Uh, there's, a, there's a question that I've wrestled with for decades and, and I've not been able to get a good answer to it. Uh, there are a number of studies that have seemed to indicate that if you feed a high level of fiber during mm -hmm. gestation, that you can improve subsequent reproductive performance. Now, the data have never been clear enough to actually draw that conclusion, right. but they've, they've, been, uh, uh, they've been strong enough to at least draw interest in my interest. And uh, we actually contributed a bit of that at, at uh, Minnesota with Chad Hagen's thesis feeding uh, alfalfa hay wedge to cells, and he seemed to get a, a bit of a, a boost in, in reproduction. And so that's, a, that's an area that I think we've never pursued adequately. And now that we have some tools that we didn't have back then, uh, we have much more understanding of gut sensing and of the, the gut-brain axis, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to, to spend some time looking at, at different fiber sources and levels for ge and during gestation and their effect on, on what's happening in the gut and in signals from the gut to the brain and see if, if we may be able to chase down some effects on reproduction. Interesting. Yes, that would be good. Um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember the, the, the one summer, large summary that I've seen. Yeah, it took a few cycles, and then the, in that second cycle, she increased the intake by a little bit in, in lactation, and then um, maybe total born a little bit. But yeah, you, um, same page there. It would be nice to have a better large scale high clarity type of study uh, and today with some of these um, electronic feeding in gestation and, and lactation it's it's much easier to do right very nice from a high level any other comments on swine nutrition or any other challenges for the current industry from a nutrition standpoint uh, besides the fiber aspect anything that you'd like to share before we jump into production and other areas well I I, I think it's useful to see where we've been and where we've come from. Yeah. Uh, and we certainly have made a lot of changes in nutrition over the last few decades, and we continue to, to make those changes. Most of those changes are in, uh, in the realm of what I would consider fine-tuning of nutritional programs. And so we're, we're continuing to refine our estimates of of uh, nutrient requirements, refine our estimates of the nutrient contributions of feedstuffs and so on. Uh, we have moved 
from uh, uh, metabolizable energy to net energy. Uh, we've moved from crude protein to amino acids mm -hmm. to ileal digestible amino acids. Right. We've moved to digestible phosphorus. And so we've made a lot of progress in, yes. in fine tuning that. And I think that's been very important to the industry as we've, as we've done that. I, I would say also that you can think of science, of progress in science, as being to some extent a slow progress in, in fine tuning or refining. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly there's a, there's a leap forward and we make significant progress in one leap and then we can start fine tuning that again. And it seems to me that we've had, not everybody who might be listening to this would have a different set of examples of that. I, I would offer some examples. Uh, one is um, the feeding of the newly weaned pig. When we realized that we had to pay attention not only to nutrient levels, but to nutrient sources in the diet. And uh, uh, much of that goes back to, uh, to some, uh, some progress uh, at uh, your alma mater at K-State uh, years, years ago. And uh, uh, another one would be phytase. I think that, that was a, a game changer in many ways, not only in terms of the way we formulate diets, and, uh, but also in terms of environmental effects. And, uh, and so I think that's important. One, there are two others that kind of, are kind of connected that I would mention together. Uh, one of them is the ideal amino acid ratios, and the other is the availability of crystalline amino acids, uh, because I think those two kind of fit together. The first time I read a paper about, uh, that was proposing ideal amino acid ratios, uh, it was by Des Cole at the University of Nottingham, and I thought that's crazy. I thought you can't have ideal ratios because it depends on the ratio of how much of those amino acids are going to growth versus maintenance. And that changes as the pig grows. In fairly short order, I came around to being a strong supporter of the, of the concept, recognizing that the ratios are going to change as the pig grows. The ratios change if, if you feed fiber. The ratios change if you stimulate the immune system. But those are small changes. And we can, we can manage those changes. So I think the the ideal amino acid ratios and then the, the availability of crystalline amino acids that helps put that in play. I think that's been a, a game changer for us. So those are just some examples of what I consider leaps forward. Absolutely. No, I love it. And something that I, I personally get a little frustrated is with, um, for example, rack dopamine, right? Has been a major finding. And now we cannot use, you know, uh, another one is immunocastration, which is, pretty solid from a science, science standpoint, but then now you get into consumer and other things. Do you have any insights there on like, uh, you know, radical uh, innovation I, not being implemented? I, uh, that's that's a, a, good, a good point. I am very disappointed that we're not using immunocastration in, in the U.S. And I know some countries are using it effectively. Uh, and, and so to me, it's a big disappointment. I predict that the next major change that will be imposed on the industry by outside forces, mm. whether it be government or market, will, be, uh, will relate to uh, uh, surgical castration without anesthesia. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, and so I, I think if we could just use the immunocastration, we wouldn't have that issue to, to struggle with. But, and I don't know how we're going to struggle with it, but I do expect that we'll have to in some way. Right. I think that's probably a fair, fair uh, prediction there, Dr. Pettigrew. Very good. Now, if we transition a little out of the nutrition maybe and get into overall production, just wine production in general from the business side of things and, and the production itself, um, you've seen a lot of changes, you know, going through from um, continuous flows to multi-site production and, and other things. Anything else that you want to highlight in this area? Well, I think you're right. We, we have, uh, and by the way, I think, I think all in, all out, big flow is, is one of the most important things that we've done as an industry. Right. And it can be implemented in more than one way, but, but the all in, all out aspect, I think, is, is crucial. 
Right. Uh, but, uh, but if you step back and look at where we are in production now and compare that to where we were decades ago, you know, I, my dad was recognized in the community as a good pig man, mm -hmm. but he couldn't compete at all now. He couldn't be close to competing. Mm -hmm. even, even good producers in the 1980s, 1990s, they, can't, they couldn't compete now if they continued to do what they were doing then. We've just made so much progress. And, and so we, we need to sometimes step back and appreciate the progress that we've, that we've made. We do have, uh, I think we've learned recently that, that external forces can sometimes influence the way we produce pigs. Uh, we've seen that in the case of antibiotic use. Uh, we've seen that in the case of gestation traits. Uh, and I think we've, uh, we've learned or in the process of learning that we can make those adaptations and, and we, can, uh, uh, we can still survive and, and do well in, in the pig business in spite of that. And, that's, and I think we'll, we'll manage the, the castration issue in some way that will work for the industry. One thing that I think we may change, see change that will be internally driven rather than externally driven is weaning age. Uh, and I don't know that this is going to happen, but I think it might. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's some interesting data produced by uh, Adam Mosier at, mm -hmm. at Michigan State shows that weaning age has a, a substantial impact on growth rate and feed efficiency, at least growth rate of pigs all the way to market. Right now, I'm, I think we need to see confirmation of that. We need to see it fine-tuned a little bit in terms of what weaning ages are, are uh, uh, most important. But it seems to me that, uh, that we're likely at some point to decide that we don't want to wean pigs at 21 days. Just as we decided several years ago, we didn't want to wane pigs at 17, 18 days. And so we, we built more farrowing rooms. And now I think, I think, I predict there will be another round of building farrowing rooms so we can extend the weaning age. Right. And, and I tell that I've seen uh, several systems recently going to a little older weaning age already, already you know, 22 all the way up to 24. So I think that that's ex is spot on what you, with uh, what you're saying, and I think it probably goes back to you know the, the the health of that production flow. If it's healthy, probably fine with 21 days. But if it's not unhealthy, not healthy, then that's where I think there's major benefits there. The work from Dr. Mosher is is, is very enlightening there from from a winning age and, yeah. and leaky gut uh, standpoint. Very exactly. cool. You, you also mentioned the, the business of pig production, and I'm not the one to, to talk about that. And I certainly would not offer advice to anybody, uh, business advice to anybody running a, a pig production system. But, you know, we have a lot of people coming into the business, mm -hmm. whether they be new graduate students who have no background in, mm -hmm. in the, the industry, whether they're coming into companies uh, that support the industry and they don't really understand it. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to direct just a few comments to those people about some of the, some of the key aspects of the swine business. And the first thing I would say is that it's a commodity business. And that means that you, you cannot differentiate your product. So when you produce a pig, it's, the market says it's the same as, some, as a pig somebody else produces. Mm -hmm. And in a commodity business, the way you increase your profits is to control costs. Mm -hmm. And that's why the pig production industry is so cost driven. And it's not always pleasant to be cost driven, but it is necessary in a, in a commodity business. And so uh, I just like for everybody to understand that, that that's the reason you have to control costs. Now, controlling costs is not enough. You have to have a lot of other things. You have to have uh, a good market. You have to have access to capital. You have to have all the other things that the, uh, you have to you have to have good personnel management. You know, how many times have you heard somebody say dealing with pigs is the easy part of this business. It's the people that's the, the difficult part. So, so there are all these other complicating factors besides the, the need for cost control. 
right? I love it. You, you, you probably will be surprised, but, and you probably remember this article from Dr. Lehman, 1989, he, he, he talked about education. I want to say it's 89, educational diseases. And he talks about <laughs> exactly that arena too of, um, you know, uh, really how do you help a pig producer and, and those sorts of things and, and goes along too on the cost side of things. And, and it's, I love it. I love it. It's, uh, it's very good, good for, for young folks like me and others to, to really hear that. I appreciate that. Um, if we go into the teaching aspect of things, you've, you've trained a lot of students and, and, and nutritionists and, and Dr. Mike Tokash, uh, that was one of my advisors there at K-State. Um, so what has been the insights there from, from just interacting with um, lots of grad students and, and also the, the teaching aspect of things too? Any, any, anything that, that you can comment on that arena? Um, well, I have a few comments. One is that, that a lot of the excitement comes from watching the students grow, watching them mature and, and become scientists and professionals. And, uh, and uh, you mentioned Mike Tokash. That wasn't the case with him because he, didn't, he was already a professional when he came to me. Uh, wow. <laughs> so uh, so that, wasn't a, that wasn't a problem with him. But, I think he was born uh, a professional. <laughs> I think so, yes. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so watching the students develop is, is really a, a rewarding part of the, of the job. I, for, for a number of years, I taught the uh, Principles of Animal Nutrition course at, at Minnesota, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, but uh, this is something else that came as a surprise to me and made to others as well. I think I learned more nutrition teaching that course for the first time than I knew before, than I got from my graduate program, uh, because I had to, I had to look more broadly at uh, at the whole field of nutrition, and uh, and read in depth and and broadly, uh, so that I could convey that to the students. So that's uh, I think as a teacher you learn a lot. The other comment I would make about teaching is one that's, that's in the news all the time now, and that is the controversy about on-site teaching versus uh, remote teaching. Uh, I actually spent some time before I retired looking at distance education opportunities and what, uh, uh, what was available and what kinds of things could be done. And I, I concluded that distance education can work, can work very effectively. Uh, and uh, the, uh, what a student comes out of the course with can certainly rival what would happen in an on-farm or on, on, in an on-campus environment, in my, in my opinion, if it's done well. So one of the problems we have is that we have faculty members all across the country who know how to teach in classrooms, mm-hmm. who may not know how to teach on. Now the skills certainly overlap significantly, but they're not exactly the same. You know, you need to do some things, some things a bit differently. Uh, but I think, I think, uh, as a as a first take home message, that it can work very effectively if it's, nice. uh, if it's done well. I am really impressed with faculty all over this country mm-hmm. uh, who have re- reacted during the later stages of the academic year just ended and now going into the new one by heroically uh, shifting their courses online when they'd never done it before. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's an enormous undertaking. And, uh, and I think they've done remarkably well. I'm, I'm very impressed with, with what they've done. Uh, as we go forward, I think, I think that the remote learning can work. And let me be clear here. I'm talking about university mm-hmm. teaching. I have no idea about elementary school teaching, okay. uh, whether, whether it's as, as effective there. But, but I think for universities, it can be effective. A couple of things that may be missed 
is that it's difficult and it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Universities have an infrastructure built for on-campus instruction. Most of them do not have a big infrastructure for distance education. And so there, and so there are costs in building that infrastructure. There's also a, a, an enormous amount of faculty time that goes into shifting from on classroom to online. Uh, but, uh, and that, uh, that has cost. Now it may not show up in a budget somewhere because that faculty member salary is, is a line item, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still a cost. And that faculty member is not doing something else because they're doing that. Right. Interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, any wrap up comments here before we get, get let me, into the, let me just follow up on that. Okay. Let me just follow up on that last comment. Okay. Because I, I think there is still real value in on campus teaching. And I think, in it, I think that, uh, that value is probably more for some students than for others. Okay. But the on campus environment is, is one that is sort of an educational process on its own. I can, I can go back to my experience as an undergraduate. Here I was coming from a fairly narrow environment, a protected environment, and suddenly I was dumped into this campus and, and my world exploded. And I was, I was immediately immersed in all these people and things that were foreign to me, like people from the suburbs of Chicago, because I'd never known them. And, uh, and so there was a lot of opening up. And now I don't think many of our students now would have that same degree of, of opening up when they go to campus. But there's still a lot of broadening experiences that you get from exposure to a lot of different people on campus. And so I, I think the, the sooner we can get back on campus, the better, mm -hmm. especially for students coming out of high school. Mm -hmm. I think if you're looking at somebody who's supporting a family, working full time and wants to get a degree, online education is great. Yeah, and, and probably the final answer is going to be a little bit of a, a mix between the two, right? Long term, probably going to use the best world of, of each. Well, I think, I think on campus education will be better because there will be an online component. We've been moving in that direction for a long time, as you know, but, right. uh, but I think we'll accelerate that. Yeah. Very good. So before we get into the last session here, which are the famous three questions that we ask every guest, which is the books and, and, and what do you think sets apart uh, successful SWAN professionals? Anything else uh, overall bef you want to you wanna chat before we get into that session, Dr. Pettigrew? No, I think uh, I think this is, uh, has been fun, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to do it. Absolutely, absolutely. I appreciate your time. And so the first question is, uh, what's your favorite uh, pig-related book? Well, I choose one that is uh, now 25 years or so old, and it is relatively obscure, mm -hmm. and it is called growth in the pig and it is a spin-off from a, a short course that several of us taught for a few years mostly in the Netherlands uh, but and the, the reason that I choose it as a favorite is not because I was involved in it mm -hmm. uh, but I choose it as a favorite because uh, there are major contributions here from some people that I consider outstanding scientists and that I also consider friends uh, and so that would include Martin Verstegen from the Netherlands, John Black from Australia, Paul Moen from New Zealand, uh, the late Case de Lange originally from the Netherlands and spent his career in Canada. And there were others as well, but those are four that stand out. And so it's, it's those people who made me choose this book as my favorite big book. Very cool. And, and I, I, I cannot say that I've read the whole book, but I've read sessions of it uh, on an as-needed basis. And it's amazing because you start understanding the pig from a mathematical standpoint, right? That's really what the book's about. Exactly. Exactly. And there's, 
there was actually uh, some detailed nutrition. And Paul Mullen, for instance, has a, a lengthy discussion of how to analyze amino acids. And, wow. And all the things that can go wrong. And so, very cool, very cool. How about the pig, uh, pig no, a book not related to pigs? Okay. I choose uh, a book called Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress okay. uh, by Stephen Pinker. Now, and this was published two or three years ago, uh, but uh, Stephen Pinker became frustrated by all the negativity he was hearing mm. uh, about, uh, uh, about how bad things are in the world. Yeah. And he didn't believe it. And, uh, and I, I think it, it, it was, it's always there. I think uh, during the previous presidential election cycle, we heard maybe more of it than, than usual. Uh, but, uh, but he set out to, to prove it's not true. And so he, uh, he assembled a, an in, enormous amount of data showing how things have changed over decades and sometimes over centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was things like uh, lifetime. What's, what's the average lifetime of people? Progressively increasing over, over the time. Uh, the most it's ever been. Uh, infant mortality progressively decreases. Maternal mortality progressively decreases. The number of people killed in war, it's a definitely a downtrend. The number of people murdered, definitely a downtrend uh, over not just a year or two, but over decades and, and centuries. Uh, the number of people killed in car crashes, trending downward over, over time. Uh, the number of countries living in a, with a, a democratic government progressively increasing over time. Now, that doesn't mean that every year it goes up, but it means that if you look at a 10 year, 100 year yeah. time period, Yeah, the direction of the trend is is clear. We always wonder when when we see what appears to be a reversal of a trend like that. Is this really a reversal, or is this just an interruption? And, and we never know until we get somewhere beyond that. But but the the data are are really impressive and showing how much things are better. In fact, he says that some of the poorest people in the world today, mm -hmm. the dollar of people have better lives than the aristocracy had in the middle ages. Wow. That's of amazing. Improvements in and, and, and other things. And so, right. So, uh, wow. so I, I recommend that. I think it's, I, it's very, uh, very interesting. I would definitely buy it. Um, it's something that I, that I, sometimes I get into discussions with friends, uh, same thing, you know, um, Things are way better today than several decades ago. And I think uh, the more people watch the news, the less they realize that, right? And uh, yeah. the news is all about what, the, a distillation of what's the worst things happening in the globe right now, right? Things that way, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So that's, right. that's amazing. I love it. I need to read that book. Very good. And then the last one is what sets apart successful swine professionals Uh, from those that are not, you mentioned several very successful swine researchers. So what, what sets them apart? Well, I would, I would suggest some things that really have nothing to do with the swine industry that would be the same as I would apply if you were in, the, in some other completely different industry. Mm -hmm. Because I think the characteristics are, are largely the same. And, you know, you could go on all day talking about what those are. And I, I, I'll try not to do that. I'll mention only three characteristics that I think, uh, uh, that I think are key. One is passion. I think you need a passion for what you do. Uh, you need something that gets you up in the morning eager to go to work and that causes you to uh, work after dinner instead of watching TV and, and all of those things and, and make a, a real contribution. Now, that, that passion can be a lot of different things. Uh, it can be a passion to make money, uh, and that's okay as far as I'm concerned. Uh, or it can be a, cash, a, a passion to build, build prestige 
or it can be any number of other things. And it doesn't have to stay the same forever. My passion changed. When I first started my career, my passion was helping farmers. Mm -hmm. As I went through my career, my experiences broadened, my interests broadened, and my passion was making a contribution to the challenge of producing food for the people of the world. Wow. And so, but, but I think you need a passion of, of some sort to, to drive you to, to make the contributions. The second thing I would, I would mention is that openness to, to new ideas. We always uh, uh, have these things that we've been taught or that we decided and we know that uh, we know they're right. You know, we just know. And then something comes along and that seems to disagree with it. And, uh, and so my argument is that, that when that happens, you need to be prepared to look back at what you believe and why you believe it. And what are the, what's the evidence in favor of it? And you may very well say, yes, I believe it. And this other stuff can't be right. Or you may say, you know, it's, uh, maybe I need to moderate that a little bit. And so, so I think you need to be open to, to uh, reevaluating the things that, uh, that you believe uh, when, the, when the evidence doesn't agree with them. There's a, the American author, uh, Mark Twain, who wrote the, the classic novels, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and, and other things as well. But Mark Twain said, what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. Mm -hmm. What gets us into trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. And, and you need to be open to reconsidering some of some of your beliefs when when there is occasion uh occasion to do that i love it and, and the third thing i would mention i was just gonna go say a, sh a short comment on this second one is that well it, a lot of times writing pig production we have maybe a producer that has been doing the same thing for 30 years and it's like no this is the way to do it sure but things change the pig change you know there's a lot of things that change in and i'm faced with the same challenge sometimes you know we you believe something for a long time but stepping back and reassessing that uh, i think i agree we have always to be open to that right yeah. one example in swine nutrition for a long time we had the uh, uh, sort of rule of thumb that you could use three pounds of crystalline lysine per ton of feet and, uh, and then we started seeing diets with a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. And we said, wait a minute, that, that doesn't fit. We <laughs> looked back at the data that supported that three pounds per ton. And, and it, was, it was really confined to a, a fairly narrow range of conditions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that was a, it was an enormously helpful rule of thumb for a long time. It just didn't last forever. Right, until you have uh, methionine and trionine that you could add in the diet, right? It was probably right. good for this. Right. Very good. Okay, the third thing I would, I would say is be a team player. Cooperate, collaborate. If you work for a company, then you're in that company's team and you need to work together. Uh, if you're, uh, uh, even if you're a, a university professor running a, a sort of a single lab uh, and you think you're all independent, but you're still probably dependent to some extent on your colleagues. Maybe, maybe they have a lab technique that you need, and so your student goes to their lab, or maybe you share. But I think there's, there's real value, and, and employers perceive this value in being a, a, a team player and, and not making it just about you, but making it about something bigger than you. I love it. So that's what I would say. Very good. Wow, Dr. Perigo, this has been very uh, insightful. It's the first time we ever met. I think most of the guests in the show, at least I've met a few times, uh, or, uh, but you, you and I, first time we meet here today. So I really appreciate your time. It's been a blast talking to you, and I hope you, you have a great rest of the, the year here. Well, good. Thank you. It's been, it's been good. I appreciate it.